Welcome to In Search of the New Compassionate Male. My name is Clay Boykin. I support this podcast through my coaching practice. I help people visualize and harmonize, find direction and meaning, or simply get unstuck. Contact me at clayboykin.com for a free consultation. Now here's the latest episode of In Search of the New Compassionate Male. Yeah. And I, when I talked with my class, I told you about just a few days ago, I told them something that I think I've told you that I've done a lot of courses and course development and, and here's the curriculum. And at the end of this class, you will be able to describe, compare and contrast all action verbs. It's behavioral, but I've never seen yet a class that has this. By the end of this class, you should have experienced awe. You should have a tingle from the joy of learning at some point. You should have more questions than you have answers and be delighted about it. (laughs) Now, you can't measure that. The school would fire me if I tried it, any school, because it's not the way it works. But to tell somebody, here's what they're going to learn, I think limits it. You're so right. And when you were just describing the awe, I could feel that. I mean, I, I could really feel that. And we said, it can't be measured. You're right. And I thought to myself, well, maybe I can measure it. it it's this complete feeling. It, it's a feeling of completeness and a sense of wanting to move forward with it. I don't know if that makes any sense or not. It, it's, it needs music. It's like music. Mm-hmm. Let me ask you, what, what brought you to bring poetry out in that class? Because it's a way of bypassing people's defenses, uh, jumps right over mm. to the emotion of the thing. I'll tell you the poem I used. I apologize if I've used this before, but it's a Robert Frost poem called Two Tramps in Mud Time. Mud time is the time when people really can't travel. So the tramps would sit around and stand around and talk and and occasionally one of them would stand up and hold forth and nobody judged them matter of fact they told the truth to each other they all knew they were tramps but one guy jumped up and he said yield who will to their separation my true object in living is to unite my vocation and my avocation is my two eyes are one in sight. Mm. Only where love and need are one. This is, I love this, this verse. Only where love and need are one. And work is play for mortal stakes. Is the deed ever really done for heaven and the future sakes? So work is play, but it's for mortal stakes. It's, it's like saying, you know, if you do a job you love, you never go to work every, in your rest of your life. It's play, but it's, for, it's really serious. It's about your legacy. It's about the ripples you make in the fabric of the cosmos before you leave us here. And there, there, and the, the second one I used was by Antonio Machado, who was considered one of Spain's best poets. He was killed in the Spanish Civil War, the uh, poem is untitled and said, it's one day the wind came to me with the odor of jasmine. And the wind said, in exchange for the odor of my jasmine, I would like the odor of your roses. I have no roses, I said, all of my flowers are dead. And the wind said, then I'll take the withered petals and the falling waters of the fountain 
and the wind left. And I wept. And I said to myself, what have you done with the garden that was entrusted to you? So I just said, <laughs> here are a couple of poems. <laughs> Yeah, changes things. I I usually start out with a with a poem, and um, so early on, as I'm thinking about it, is it possible that that that's the yearning that we all have? I'm mean, sitting in a classroom like that, you know, wondering what it's going to be like. Am I going to fit in? You know, we're all sitting in you know, squared up in the chairs, however. Is that just right below the surface? Is the one and the desire to connect and, and to feel that? And it doesn't take much. And that's what you were, were doing, demonstrating that it doesn't take much just to pierce that and let it flood out. It doesn't make, take much to change the whole flavor of the room, the spirit of a room for, for evil or good. There's a poet named David White. Who, oh, yes. Yeah, you've seen his stuff. Uh, I heard him speak once. He memorized 2,000 poems at that time, but that was 20 years ago. But he, in his book, there's a, the shortest poem in the book. He used to go around to large corporations and talk to them about poetry and, and quote poems and to their boards and to their, to their employees. So one day he had done this thing and it's just a short poem and then they shared it all. They got 15 minutes for what they were gonna do. And the first woman who spoke stopped the room and here's all she said. She said, one day, 15 years ago, I turned my head for a moment and it became my life. Remember that? She had she had taken this job, at, and I think it was with IBM, could have been anything. It was gonna be temporary. She turned her head for a moment. She was young and vital and living a life. And then this became her life. Everybody went, ah. <laughs> I so identify with it. I met David White. I did too. He, um, I was at Motorola and uh, he was brought in by our wellness director. And this was in the late eighties, call it 89, 88, something like that. And uh, I thought to myself, this is great, but nobody's going to connect with this. You know, I felt like I could. And, uh, and he spoke to all the execs. And uh, he held the room. Yeah. He really did. He really did. I'll never forget that. Hmm. Yeah, I wish I could remember so many things like that. <laughs> I'm sure I could if I... I hadn't thought about that in years. Oh, my goodness. But he would... Um, he held our room, too, that I was in. He would sit and wait for a minute between poems for inspiration about what to do next, or even during a poem, when he would go within himself while he's giving the reading and then come back out with a different kind of, same poem, different kind of energy. You could hear a pen drop in those silences. Those silences, I remember better than I do most of the words that he said. Isn't that something? How silence yep. has that effect. Countless times have I been in meetings, you know, back in the day, where silence was the opportunity for the next person to immediately jump in because they had been sitting there thinking about their thought <laughs> the whole time, not listening to one word you're saying, you know, jump to get in there. And then the other 
I experienced when I was uh, traveling to Japan. And uh, we were negotiating with Toshiba. It was a kind of a quarterly thing we did with the products that we had. And um, I was cautioned. Once you say something, zip it. Do not say another thing until they respond. And, uh, oh my gosh, it felt like an hour, you know, maybe a minute, <laughs> maybe two minutes. <laughs> and uh, because we're so trained that silence isn't good. And uh, one of the people on the other side, when the Japanese managers would lean to the other and whisper something and then come back. And then they re would respond. And I first thought it was the, you know, the first person who speaks loses. And maybe it was some of that. But more, I think it was them respecting and giving thought to what I said. Giving that space for that, that thought to, to complete itself. And uh, that's been the same thing in our men's circle. Now, one time, it's been a couple of times, I said, okay, after somebody speaks mentally, count to five before you speak. And when you speak, you have to build on what that person was saying and then take your point. That's hard. But yes, that, it is. Yeah, but that, that was that became magic in there to give what the man has said room, give it space to, to be there in the air for people to process it and find the richness in it. Even if it's something that doesn't appear to be so deep, but let it soak in and, and, it, and it does. And that was, That was some of our most intimate moments. And it wasn't this pregnant pause. It was, it was, the energy was almost palpable in the room. You know, like you said, you could hear a pin drop. It, it was that kind of energy. And the next person would, would offer in, and then the next person. And those evenings were magic. It's by my experience with the few of your men's groups that I've attended that you do a, have done a better job of that, of teaching that than of modeling that. Otherwise you wouldn't be teaching it hmm. that I've ever seen in men's groups. And I've been in a few of them. Some were intense, some weren't, but again, it's, it's not much of a part of our, shared expectation. And I once gave a talk to about a 400 lawyers. It was in San Diego and it was a convention of real estate lawyers and they wanted to hear something. They wanted a quick elevator speech about servant leadership. That's about what they wanted, <clears throat> which is fine. But I started out Looking back, I don't know if this, this is the smartest or the stupidest thing I ever did. <laughs> but my, my reasoning was that they had a motive to serve somewhere buried in their decision to be a lawyer, just like teachers do. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I said, I'd like to take one minute of silence. And I would like for you to reflect on why you became a lawyer. <clears throat> not what you told your parents, not what you told yourself even, but what were the deeper motives for you becoming a lawyer? Okay, one minute. Well, there was some stunned silence and then there was... <laughs> You know, this kind of thing. And then a few people settled in. And at the end of it, there was, well, it wasn't a roar, but it was pretty loud talking. And one guy said, why did you do this to us? <laughs> I, said, 
I, I don't recall doing anything to you. I asked you to reflect in silence. Several people got up and started crying, saying, I hadn't thought about it for years. This is why I became a lawyer. And they had personal stories. There's only so far you can go with 400 people listening and they're your peers. But still, I think it worked. But the responses were so much more muted after that to the things I was saying. I think I thought maybe that was a good thing. Uh, I wasn't saying anything amazing, maybe in their world. But so you can tell me, was that stupid or was that accidentally smart? Accidentally smart. <laughs> With an emphasis on accidentally <laughs> Uh, I don't think it was an accident, but it was certainly smart I, <laughs> as you're as you're talking about that. And this has come to my mind several times recently. I think back at my corporate days. What if I had started every meeting with let's have a minute of silence or two minutes of silence? And not even set, do like, not even do to the extent that you did, just silence to give people centering time, calm, it, to change the, the total energy in the room and to learn what we learned in our men's circle, the, the, the power of, of silence to change things and to bring and to bring people together. But gosh, if I had asked somebody that question, the question that you asked, golly, that would have been something. You never know. Hmm. Greenleaf said, keep your mouth shut until, well, until and unless you have something to contribute. I talked to Robert Greenleaf, as you know, worked at at and He developed uh, all of the management training for the world's largest corporation. And there were some people who really plugged into him and worked with him more closely than others. Well, one of them went on to leave one of the baby bells. And these were pretty big operations. You know, Ohio Bell was pretty darn big. And the biggest one is the one that serviced New York and Manhattan. The phone service got in a terrible mess in Manhattan. People on Wall Street could not get dial tones. And so they put this guy in charge. And within a week, it got better. Within two weeks, it was almost cleared up. Within six months, that nobody even remembered how bad it was. So I talked to him for the biography of Greenleaf, and I said, what did you do? He said, see, wrong question. The answer is, what did I didn't do? What did I not do? He said, I walked in there and plopped in the chair and had folks just come in and talk. And they were telling me about the problems with this and that. In the course of doing that, they began to figure out what, what needed to be done and what was going on. And, and they would come back in and say, I'd just like to check in with you and tell you what's happening. And he'd say, well, so-and-so's got the dial tone back already. <laughs> you know? I have no idea how he did it. Mm. <laughs> he said, uh, and uh, the... The divisions are talking to each other, uh, which is good because they would come to blows with each other. And it went on and on. He said, that was it. It was just Greenleaf told me to withdraw for myself and then to give other people the silence to honor the fact that they are professionals and they have the answer and the resources somewhere in the, inside of them. Well, I thought that was good. Could part of that have been that he was creating a safe space where they felt comfortable talking? 
and not a fear of being wrong and all the bad that perceived to follow when someone is wrong. Just opening up the circle. Mm. I listening was the premier skill for being a certain leader, according to Greenleaf. And a few years ago, I pulled together everything I thought I'd learned about him and listening and uh, did a little pamphlet called Greenleaf and Servant Leader Listening. I won't go into the background of where some of this came from, but he said, look, um, you want people, people aren't going to be feeling safe in a safe space. He said, you know, I want to, I want to talk to you. So people don't usually say, I want to listen to you. So I taught a class. <laughs> he said, I taught a class at at and on listening, listening. And I called it how to talk to people. <laughs> so nobody would come if it was listening. <laughs> he said, here's the thing. Um, if, if you aren't listening, it's like, if you're just thinking about what you're going to say, and this guy reports to you, this woman reports to you, and you've got some ammunition, you're getting ready to bat back at her. He said, well, look, if you've got a, if you've got a baseball bat, you're holding behind your hand, your, your, your back and you're ready to bat back what people are saying and not saying, oh, and, and listen to what they're saying non-judgmentally, yeah. then they're going to nail you. So who wants to play that game? <laughs> you're going to lose if you don't listen. So true. I, I've had a couple of women in my life who would say, really, Don said that? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I get that. I think we all have. Yeah. Check out the latest episode of In Search of the New Compassionate Male on your favorite podcast station.